Hello, Hello you ladies are and listening. Gel- no, oh, oh, right. you're going to start, are you? All right, all right. Now, right. Jaren, you all have right. the floor. You have Thank the you floor. Very much. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to episode six of the Children of Film podcast. We have a whopper of a show for you today, including our Golden Globe nominations, uh, some movie news. It wasn't a big week for news, but uh, we're going to do a lot. We're going to do top five Fassbender movies because uh, Assassin's Creed just came out. Spoiler, it won't be in the top five. Uh, Jacob, my co-host, how are you doing today? Yeah, I'm very good, Jaron. You didn't even introduce yourself, man. You got to give yourself a bit more credit than that. But um, oh, no, nah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm. You should go I'm, first. I'm lovely today. My new sound bar arrived in the mail, so now I can finally have decent sound when I watch Ooh. movies. But uh, speaking of movies, we're going to get into our diary display, talk about all the stuff we've been watching in the last week. And boy, did we go a bit crazy for the new year. Yeah. Uh, I watched like, I've watched like 18 or so movies in the last week, most of them for the first time. So I'm going to rattle off, I'm going to rattle off a bunch of them and I'll go in depth on a couple, but no, I have been watching a lot lately. So starting on the second, I watched Indignation 2016 movie starring Logan Lerman. It was all right. Uh, I watched Rebel Without a Cause. The choice was inspired by its reference in La La Land, and it, it was re- I really enjoyed it. Uh, James Dean was really, really good. Uh, I watched Damien Chazelle's first movie, Guy and Madeline on a Park Bench. It wasn't that good. I mean, it's basically a student film, so I can't fault it too hard, but the dance numbers were good. I watched Born to be Blue, the jazz biopic about Chet Baker starring Ethan Hawke. Hawke was amazing in it. Uh, I watched Network, Cindy LeMay's film. It's been on my radar for a while. That. I thought it was really, really great. I didn't love it uh, as much as I loved things like um, Dog Day Angry Afternoon Men. and 12 Angry Men. But uh, Network was still yeah, a really, really great though. satire that's still relevant today. I watched Will Ferrell's Everything Must Go. I think that's the best performance I've ever seen from him. The kid was great. And it, it, was, it was a good little indie movie. You know, it's, it's right um, up my alley. It's Biggie Smalls' kid, isn't it? Or something like that. Yeah, Christopher Wallace Jr. He, yeah. he 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 was good in it, and uh, he was in Kicks this year that he was good in as well. But um, I watched the f- on the fifth. I watched five movies. I watched uh, The Artist. Uh, finally got around to that Best Picture winner. I really, really loved it. I'm starting to get into these classics and musicals and stuff. Classics um, came out like five years ago. You know what I mean? It's it's an <laughs> imitate. It's imitating a classic. It's a yeah. silent film. There's like no dialogue, and it's about a silent film star whose career is kind of ruined when they switch over to talkies. And it kind of mirrors the story of Singing in the Rain as well, which I also watched this week. I'll get to that in a minute. But I really, really love the artist. It's beautifully directed, and Jean Dujardin uh, is, is fantastic in it. Uh, he just has an infectious smile. I watched uh, Never Let Me Go on Jaron's recommendation. It was a good dystopian movie. The acting was good. I just wasn't really that engaged uh, by the story. Uh, I watched Why Him, which was pretty much what you expected, but it made me laugh a lot, so I can't complain. I watched Passengers, which I absolutely hated. I thought the first half was pretty good. Prack gave a good performance, and then th- the third act I wouldn't call just three evolves out of ten, absolutely hate. into... Yeah, this is not very. It's not good. Uh, the third act ruins the entire movie. It was so bad. Uh, it's so stupid. There's it, nothing makes sense. There's no logical sense, and most of my issues come from spoilers, so I can't really go too in depth on that. I watched the final movie that day, and the best one. One flew over the cuckoo's nest. Uh, Jack Nicholson. Let me tell you, that guy is incredible. I just want to go back and watch every single movie he ever did because he's so so good. Uh, it's a, it's not the movie I expected. Uh, and I, I loved it for that. It's actually quite um, an uplifting movie, I have to say. And I really, really enjoyed One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. It was fantastic. I watched Hunger, starring Michael Fassbender, Steve McQueen. I've seen all three of his films now. And Hunger is my least favorite. I thought it was good. It's really stylishly directed. But it felt like he was more interested in showing off his directorial style than he wasn't actually telling a story. And the, it was kind of weak in that point. I watched Annie Hall, Woody Allen's classic. Really, really enjoyed it. His character, while a little annoying at times, I actually saw a lot of myself in him. And uh, it, 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 the movie is so witty. Like, some of the jokes in it are really, really great. And... and and the way he breaks the fourth wall, uh, that movie pretty much changed the game. Um, a couple of days ago, I watched Denis Villeneuve's film On Sunday. Uh, it's that's pretty much his only major film I hadn't watched. He's he's got two other earlier ones that I haven't seen, but um, I loved On Sunday. Uh, it's probably my favorite movie I've seen so far this year. Uh, I it's 
it just has a great, great story. It's a mystery that unravels as you watch it and you come to really care about the characters. Uh, there's a lot of suspense and the performances are great. The cinematography is gorgeous and it just proves that Denis Villeneuve is a god amongst men and I can't wait to see what's up his sleeve next in Blade Runner. Uh, I watched Assassin's Creed, which just ruined the high I was on off of On Sunday because it was so bad. It was awful. Almost nothing redeemable about it. It was awful. Uh, I watched Locke. I rewatched that. Uh, Tom, my favorite Tom Hardy performance. Great movie. I watched Singing in the Rain yesterday. Really, really enjoyed it. I think one of the later numbers bogs the story down a little, but for the most part, I thought it was really, really great. And today, I rewatched Rush because you know I wanted to test out my new sound sound system for my TV, and uh, it, yeah, that's a good. It has good sound. The race car driving, and it's a great, great movie. And Daniel Brühl was robbed of an Oscar nomination. All right, yeah, that's That's one of my favourite films of all time. My favourite film of 2013, severely underrated. Uh, You've already gone over the time that we allow both of ourselves to have for this, but I'm just going to. Sorry, I had too many movies. I'm going to go. Well, I have. You had 18. I have about 17. Anyway, um, I watched Why Him. Uh, It's what you'd expect, but it made me laugh a lot. Two and a half out of five. I watched The Invitation. It was on Netflix, a 2016 movie, I believe. Really, really good. I really enjoyed it. The amount of suspense they created uh, through the whole film was amazing. Four out of five. I watched Woody Allen's Vicky Cristina Barcelona, uh, you know, with uh, Scarlett Johansson and um, that other chick. What's her name? That bitch. Whatever. Uh, Yeah, that was really good. I found it really, really cool. Uh, I really, really enjoyed it. The bad guy, Javier Bardem. He is amazing, and I was going to say the bad guy from No Country for Old Men, but then I remembered his name. He was really, really good in it, and so was uh, Carla Johansson and the other bitch. Sorry, I can't remember your name. I what movie Never is this? Me... I wasn't listening. Uh, it was Vicky Cristina Barcelona. Oh, um, is it, and it, who'd you say? Scar- someone Joe Hall. And... Rebecca Hall, that's the name. Oh, then Rebecca, I Never yes, Let Me Rebecca Go. Hall. Never Let Me Go, I absolutely adored. It's dystopian, it's a love story. I was really invested in the love story, and it made me really swell up, and it was also, um, you know... Sorry, that was... You can cut that out. Uh, yeah, uh, it, it, it made me swell up, you know. It was... I <laughs> just... Uh, okay, yeah, uh, and uh, I, I, I really, really enjoyed it. And, um, you know, it wasn't melodramatic, but it, it was a bit of drama. And it was really different to uh, the love story you come to expect. I watched My Left Foot, the story of Christy Brown. Uh, Daniel Day-Lewis, absolutely amazing. One of the best performances I've seen in a long, long time. He's fantastic as Christy Brown. Uh, the story is pretty boring, though, and it, it fell into some narrative... Um, you know, cliches, even though it's a true story, they kind of whooped a lot of things, so it would be more theatrical. So I gave it a three and a half out of five, although he is fantastic. I watched Victoria, that was good. I watched The Ghost Rider. The Ghost Rider uh, is fantastic. It's an absolute great movie. Uh, It's about this ghost rider uh, writing for this guy. Oh, I thought um, you said Ghost Rider for a second. I'm like, what? Ghost Rider? (laughs) <laughs> no, Ghost Writer, Writer, yeah, know, writing stuff down. It's by Roman Polanski, uh, and I found it absolutely incredible. I gave it a four out of five, and um, it's really, really, really suspenseful and you know intricate and stuff like that. It was really cool. Uh, it gets a little boring, though. I watched Pixar's The Good Dinosaur, so I now can officially have say I've seen every Pixar movie, because I'd seen every one, every one, like, as immediately came out, but I never really got around to this. Three out of five, it was fine. That's that's the thing that defines this movie fine. Um, I watched Passengers, which I thought is pretty underrated. I gave it three and a half out of five. I <laughs> loved the first two acts. I thought it was great. You're a cunt. Um, and I thought the last act was <laughs> absolutely abysmal. It was really, really bad. But for me, it didn't tear down, uh, especially the first act, which I think was fantastic. Just Chris Pratt alone. The second act, I still think, was really good. But the last act was horrible. But it didn't tear down the first two. It was just horrible on its own. Uh, I watched Seeking a Friend for the End of the World, Kira Knightley and Steve Carell. They're both just so charming, man. They are so charming together. I love them together. It's such a cute movie about the end of the world. It reminded me of a movie called These Final Hours, although not as, um, you know, dark, um, because it's about the end of the world, but it's about Steve Carell. He's trying to, you know, he's trying to have a, he's not trying to have a good time, but, like, he's trying to redeem himself, and they fall in love, and it's just so cute, and the ending is fantastic, really underrated, four out of five. This is the end I rewatched. amazing, so funny, rewatchable to the end of time, four out of five. I watched Triple Nine, I still really enjoy that, so underrated from 2016. Everyone is fantastic in that, especially Norman Reedus, who's, spoiler, 
Uh, I won't say it. Uh, and Casey Affleck <laughs> is really, really good. Um, and I don't think uh, Aaron Paul had enough to do, but he was good. Um, three out of five. Three and a half, sorry. Not that's not that. Uh, I watched The Nice Guys, four out of five. Absolutely love that. Ryan Gosling is one of the best comedic performances of the year. I watched L. I think L was horrible. I really disliked <laughs> it. It was really disjointed. Didn't like the main character. Didn't, didn't get the motivations, which you're supposed to dislike the main character, but you didn't get the motivations. I just, I, I mean, you're supposed to, like, know what she's doing. Like, it just transcends. It, it delves into just stupidity. It's, I just really didn't like it, although she was very, very good in it. And I watched today Annie Hole as well. Fantastic movie. So witty, so charming. Not what I expected. Really great. You can definitely tell it's a Woody Allen movie. Right on. Our plan to keep the show short has so far gone horribly wrong, but oh, yes, uh, is, let, let's, let's keep the train rolling. Uh, we got some movie news this week. We got some, some, some decent, interesting stuff to talk about. Yeah. Firstly, I want, I want to say uh, Keegan-Michael Key has joined the cast of Shane Black's upcoming Predator reboot. Now, we've got upcoming Alien and Predator movies, and we've just been gradually getting more like leaks of cast members joining, and it's been really exciting to see the people joining these. And both movies have had some comedians come into a serious movie and uh i'm happy with this because uh king Mulkey, i think is a really talented dude i thought he was the best part of why him uh he played what oh, was definitely. his name Gu- gunter or oh, something or a g name Goody maybe i don't know but he was like franco's assistant and he was like a german and he was funny as uh so i'm really happy to see him there he was great and don't think twice as well uh, so that's really cool. And they also cast uh, the star of Moonlight, Travante Rhodes, which uh, I haven't seen yet, but I think uh, that's 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 a really cool casting. And uh, also in it, you've got uh, Boyd Holbrook and uh, Livia Munn. And isn't is it Benicio Del Toro in it? Or is that uh, a different I, movie no, I'm thinking no, of? No, no, no. I think that's another one. Um, I was just looking at IMDb. I didn't see him on it. Maybe he has been confirmed, just not added to it yet, but um, I'm not 100% sure. Don't quote us on that. Yeah, I'm, nah, I'm probably thinking of something different. But anyway, yeah. what do you think of uh, big uh, Keegan know. Key? Oh well, I there? mean, yeah, I mean, I mean, he's not just a really good comedic actor, although he's fantastic. He's so funny. You know, I think it will be good to see him stretch his dramatic uh, lengths. And you know, Shane Black, you know, this isn't going to be a hard drama. You know, there's going to be a lot of comedic elements to this. And then when it hits, it's going to hit. I'm so excited for this. Comes in 2018. It's going to be just incredible I'm so keen for Shane Black I love all his movies even the ones he wrote like Lethal Weapon ah uh, Jaren and uh, the original ben- Predator he wrote Benicio dropped out and Boyd Holbrook replaced him uh, so yeah. uh interesting well, Holbrook, Hol- but- Holbrook's probably like 20 years younger than him if he's playing yeah. the same character that'll be interesting but uh who knows maybe they'll just we'll at see. the same time but um yeah I'm I'm just you know shame it's he's it's not it's interesting but it's not that interesting because Shane Black always has some comedic actors in his films anyway Jacob uh, John Francis Daly's murder mystery, uh, John Francis Daly, known for doing things like Horrible Bosses, which I think is an incredibly underrated comedy, so good. Uh, his, his murder mystery, which I may assume is a comedy, maybe not, stars Rachel McAdams and Jason Bateman. How do you think about that? Um, yeah, I think I'm just reading here. I, I think it was, it did say it's a comedy because, um, you know, it's... Jason Bateman is probably oh, yeah, a comedy, although he was great in The Gift. He the was gift, so good though, in The Gift, and I want to see him do more dramatic shit. But, like, um, Francis Daly and Jonathan Goldstein, I think they did Vacation, uh, which I didn't Ugh. see, but I heard bad things. But um, It's not great. Yeah, but uh, uh, yeah. Game Night, yeah, it's it's a comedy. And just these two stars alone uh, has me, me excited. excited for it. But um, it's... Uh, do we know much about the plot? It's like a family game night or some I shit. I heard it's it goes a, they go wrong. they go to a game night, not a family one. They go or they go to a family game night and someone is murdered and they have to find the killer or something. <laughs> so it just sounds like Cluedo. All right. I don't mind dark the comedies. Uh, so we'll we'll, we'll see that. that comedies involving murder are always funny. Yeah. But um no, nah. Jason Bateman he plays the straight man in every comedy and he does it well and that's the reason he's still being oh, yeah. cast in so many movies. Exactly. Uh, he plays Jason Bateman and, yeah. but he plays it well. Yeah, and uh, I just oh he was so good in the gift though. I just I want to see more of that. <laughs> yeah, but, I um, that now. No, nah, we'll We'll have to see. I think you you said there was something about the new av- a budget of the new Avengers right. movie being the really Avengers, big. <laughs> the Avengers three and four, their budget is going to be four hundred and eighty five million dollars. So is that combined or each? I think it's each Jesus because it's two, well two hundred and fifty was for Civil War, so you wouldn't think it would be it wouldn't be that big a news if it was 
So anyway, that is incredible. Like, what? Why would you? <laughs> I mean, it's obviously going to be a success. It's going to make double that back. But like, that is an insane amount of money. I mean, Disney could make the budget three billion, and they would still be rich. So oh, yeah, it doesn't really matter. Like they Disney could just throw three billion in a bin. They could just and they'd be throw rich. money. Up. I mean, three hundred million of it's probably going to Robert Downey Jr. alone. So fucking oh yeah, definitely. <laughs> so like no, I mean they can do whatever they want, and these movies are going to be huge. They're going to bring together a lot of characters. That's a lot of salaries that need to be paid, and a obviously big, there's going to be a lot big of big big and effects. Salaries, yeah. Big, big effects, big set pieces, big, oh, yeah. you know, there's going to be a massive crew, visual and effects. If there's artists, anyone so, to control yeah. them, it's the Russo brothers. Yeah, so I'm very keen for these. I mean, the budget's, the budget's getting really excessive. But when are we going to get our first movie that has, like, an over $500, $600 million budget? I mean, it's just, it's getting oh, a bit ridiculous. Probably Avatar 2. Eh, <laughs> <laughs> James yeah. Cameron. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm yeah, not the only one who's movies. not excited at all for the Avatar sequels. Like, I just he left it too long for me to care, really. Oh yeah, he really did. But um, no, he made all his movies are at least good. Mm. You can't touch the guy. And Terminator One and Two are fantastic. But uh, finally, movies. finally in news, uh, a few days ago, the uh, again where we love awards shows, but uh, a couple days ago, the Writers Guild Awards nominations were announced, uh, and this is usually a good precursor for the Oscars. Uh, although I think in one choice in particular, it won't be. But uh, we'll get into that. Um, <laughs> we'll the uh, the, no- the nominees for the Writers Guild Awards for original screenplay were Hello High Water, La La Land, Loving. Manchester by the Sea and Moonlight so no surprises there but uh, it looks like they're keeping Moonlight an original the Oscars have moved it to Adapted but yeah, uh, which I is guess lucky the... because it, it, yeah. it won't be a it, because the only thing that would steal it from Moonlight would be Man- Manchester and La La Land so it does look like maybe it has a, a surefire win for Adapted Screenplay we'd have to see yeah I mean a uh, Adap- adapted isn't a uh, very as as tight a race, but now this original screenplay race is really tight. You've got Manchester by the Sea and Moonlight, which are the traditional favourites, but then La La Land just won the globe, won the globe so that puts so. it firmly in the conversation too. You can't and, get rid uh, of Hell or High Water either. That is a fantastic screenplay. Personally, I think Hell or High Water has a better screenplay than La La Land, which is my favourite film in a year. But it's yeah, just it's not going to win. It's just it doesn't have the recognition. Cred. Uh, yeah, and then but Loving's no, happy Hello. to be in there. I haven't yeah. seen it. But no, I'm really glad. I'm still glad that La La Land won screenplay. Although, I, again, I haven't seen Manchester Moonlight, so I know I yeah. keep stressing that. But, uh, you know, obviously... We I'm have not to wait another rooting. month to see them in Australia. Uh, Sorry. Obvi- obviously, I'm not going to be rooting for them until I've actually seen them and have an opinion on them. But, uh, all right, we've got adapted screenplay. You've got Arrival, Deadpool. Yep. <laughs> yep, you heard that correctly. You got fences, hidden figures, and nocturnal animals. Now, and let us tell you guys, this isn't just you know it's some academy giving out some random awards. It's, it's not this like a critic the, guild or. Oh no, this, this is the Writers Guild Association giving Deadpool a screenplay nomination. That yeah, is amazing. Man. Rhett I, Reese and th- Paul Wernick would be jumping up and yeah. down. Th- these went out of few days ago i'm surprised i haven't seen anyone talking about it because that that's pretty interesting uh i don't i don't think that's going to translate to oscar glory but it's still really really cool and it's cool to see like when would you ever has a comic book movie ever been nominated for any like screenplay type award like Never. it's crazy um i mean so if the, in 2008 yeah. they had 10 slots for best picture the dark Knight. pretty much the dark Knight is the reason they have 10 slots now because yeah. everyone was so pissed it didn't get nominated because they only had five back then yeah, but like I'm glad Arrival's not out. I think Arrival will probably win either that or Nocturnal Animals, which has a lot of love. I think uh, Nocturnal Animals. I mean, I want Arrival to win, but um, I do think there is more love for Arrival out there. But it just depends. Nocturnal Animals is a movie that it can turn a lot of people off. But oh yeah, if you really, if, if you, you love really it, love it, you love you it. really love it. Yeah, me and personally, also, I fall in the middle on it. I really liked it, but I'm not in love with it. Arrival, it um, it, I mean, it's it's a lot of spectacle. Nocturnal Animals is screenplay through and through, which doesn't say anything about like the movie. That's not a downplay to either movie, but I think that maybe that'll give it the edge. Yeah, Jaron and I's opinions on Arrival and Nocturnal Animals are basically like flipped. Yep, literally. Yeah, yeah pretty much. <laughs> um, I I like but- Arrival. Don't love it. Same and. 
I love Nocturnal Animals, and we're opposites. Yeah, and vice versa. But um, documentary screenplay nominees were um, the author, the JT Leroy story, Command and Control, and Zero I Days. I haven't heard of any Ooh, of these, so I don't really have anything insightful to say, but... Well, you know, because we're documentaries of the nerds. We are, we are reporting the news. I've documentaries probably seen of the nerds. May, I've probably seen maybe like ten docos in my Unless life. It's being generous. But I, I haven't seen that. Yeah, the only one I saw one last year, Where to Invade Next, which was pretty good. But I, I'm not. It's funny, yeah, I'm I've not actually huge, seen. I actually watched like three last year. Noise. I'm not a Audrey huge documentary and Daisy guy. And that other one, and that other one. Amanda Knox and yeah. whatever the other one was. Yeah. But, uh, All right, anyway. Jacob, let's move on to the big thing. We're going to go to our predictions and see what we got right, what we got wrong, and where we fell in the middle. We're going to go on to the winners of the Golden Globes. We've talked to death about biggest. these, so we'll try not to keep it too long, but we both had the same predictions, and uh, there are a few surprises. We ended up getting 9 out of 14 for the film categories, uh, which, yeah, it's, it's not too bad, but it's less than I was expecting, because uh, there were oh, yeah. a few shocks. But um, There were a lot of surprises. Yeah, if I'm looking through, best original song was won by City of Stars, which I'm that's, that's that was my choice. I'm happy Obviously. with that. Yeah, that was mine. I'm happy that it won. We had the uh, same choices, so we'll just say we. Yeah, originals. Oh, I mean, like, emotionally, that was my favorite. Oh, yeah. Oh, definitely. <laughs> I don't yeah. care. Well, your yeah, favorite like, was uh, Audition. But out uh, of yeah, but of the nominees. Of the nominees, obviously. Best original score, Justin Hurwitz, La La Land. Hurwitz, you're yep. a god. Uh, very, very well deserved. Now, one that shocked me, La La Land took home best original screenplay as well. Which, I, uh, it was yeah, definitely I thought, swept up with the other awards, I feel. I thought Moonlight and Matt... Or Manchester was going to take it again. I haven't seen him, so I can't comment. But I'm I'm glad to see La La Land win it. I prefer Hello High Water screenplay, but I got no issues with that. Oh. Uh, but best director was won by Damien Chazelle for La La Land. The man he got straight back up on the stage. He gave a good speech. Uh, so I got six out of seven La La Land ones right because La La Land had a clean sweep. But uh, oh yeah, we voted La La Land for everything except screenplay, which is why yep for that one. <laughs> Uh, best supporting actor, Jaron. Best supporting All right, the actor. Best supporting actor. Both of us picked Mahershala Ali because Mahershala Ali had won everything. And guess who fucking won it? My man, Aaron Taylor Johnson. Sorry about your ears, fellas, but oh my god, who saw that coming? Literally no one. No, no one, one saw it coming. No one even had that him. Is awesome. Like he was like he was like picked twentieth to even be nominated, and he did it. The absolute that, the mad absolute man. Mad man. Ah, he was really, really scary in that I was movie, for and him. Uh, he's my favorite very, performance of the year. Very so far. well deserved. My favorite Supporting performance of the year. My favorite performance of the year is actually another person from that movie, Jake Gyllenhaal, oh, uh, yeah. who who is oh, who has yeah, been yeah, so yeah. underrated this two. year. Oh no, no one's talking about him. It's just it's disgraceful. Gyllenhaal is but the Aaron man Taylor for Johnson. me, but um. And, uh, I mean, I wish I wish it was Michael Shannon who got nominated instead of ATJ, but, again, <laughs> no. I have no issues with him winning because <laughs> Come, he was f- he's fantastic in it. Uh, I would have liked oh, yeah, to see so Jeff Bridges Shannon. win also, but uh, I can't wait to see Lion as well. I'm really looking forward to see Dev Patel in that just because of how great his Aussie accent is. And I, I'm a fan of Dev Patel. He it's was also perfect, good. He, he was also really good in The Man Who Knew Infinity this year, last year, a movie that not a lot of people saw, but it was pretty good. Uh, all right, best supporting actress, uh, Viola Davis for Fences one. You know, never in doubt. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, me- best foreign feature. We thought Tony Erdman would win, but L took it home. So Jaron, I guess you're not too happy with that one. But uh, uh, they can do whatever they want. Doesn't bother me. Long. Of them, I've only seen L and Divines, and Divines wasn't really that good. So you know, I don't mind L taking it. But I'm really, really looking forward to Tony Erdman, which comes out here in about three weeks. So I'm definitely going to go see that. When I get the chance to. Uh, best animated feature, of course, Zootopia fucking won. Could they Ugh. just couldn't they just couldn't help us out and give it to Kubo, could they? They just couldn't do it Bloody for globes. us. I'd trust in you. <sighs> Wankers. Um, best performance by an actress in a musical or comedy. Yeah, Emma Stone, La La Land Emma took Stone. home the win. Our girl, she is very, very close second for my favourite performance of the year. Uh, fantastic. Very glad she won. Uh, but there, there was a lot of good competition in that category. Uh, best actor in a motion picture, you get uh, comedy or musical. You guessed it, Ryan Gosling took home the W. Uh, 
Uh, very awesome. He, I thought I really liked his speech. It was very heartfelt. And, uh, yeah, no, I'm, I'm glad he won. And see, these are the La La Lands. We got one right. And to continue the La La Land train, it won Best Motion Picture, Musical or Comedy. I mean, obviously. It, it won everything else. Nothing else even had a chance. Uh, All right, let's so, go. Best Film Drama Actor. Who was going to be K. Safflake, Jacob? No one. Uh, no, no one. No one had a chance. Uh, best Film Drama Actress. We haven't seen either of these two for the one who won actor or actress. It's Natalie... Oh, Natalie Portman we thought was going to win. And Isabel Huppert, one of the biggest surprises of the night next to ATJ, it took it home, which was surprising. Yeah, I didn't see that coming. I thought Portman had it wrapped up. But again... Yeah. No complaints. She was great. I of the nominees, I thought Amy Adams was better in Arrival. I would have preferred to see her win, but uh, you know, her power was really good in L yeah. uh, as her character. But um, all right, best picture drama. We picked Manchester by the Sea, and as the show Moonlight. ended, I still thought it was going to win, but Moonlight Literally. took it home. So did I. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, a small part of me was just sitting there like, I, wouldn't it be cool if they give it to Hacksaw Ridge or something? That would <laughs> but, be, um, um, they, yeah. yeah. Like, I don't think, did Moonlight win anything else except? Uh, no, because La La Land just took everything. <laughs> yeah, literally. Um, yeah, so that that's the Globes. Uh, what, and Aaron you, Taylor I Johnson mean, stole it we from talk about, We could talk about... We could talk about biggest snubs and surprises, but biggest surprise is obviously Aaron Taylor Johnson. Like, oh, yeah. we don't even have to have a discussion. He was on the it. one I was pulling for. Like, it was. Oh, okay, come on. Yeah. Seriously. Biggest snub. What's the result that you were the most disappointed by? That I was the most disappointed by. Yeah, uh, I was most disappointed that Captain America: Civil War didn't get a nomination. Uh, but no, I'm if talking, I was going to say, yeah. yeah, no, if uh, you know. I don't really... I mean, my favourite movie out of any of these nominated is La La Land, and it absolutely swept up. Um, yeah. I haven't seen any of the other ones, but I'm disappointed L1 Best uh, Foreign Feature <laughs> because I don't think like it. it's good at all. Like, I don't think it's, you, I don't you, think it's good. You've left out a very big one, Jaron, that is my biggest disappointment. The biggest disappointment is Kubo, is Kubo and the two not winning animated feature. Not winning. I am so passionate in my love for that movie. Uh, I think it is by far the best animated film of the year. Like, it's not even close. It's the only one from this year that I can really see myself watching again. Yeah. Maybe Moana, I quite enjoyed. I could watch that again. But Kubo is one that I've already bought on Blu-ray, and I like. I really, really love the story as a film, not just an animated film. Yeah, I think I think and Moana is a great animated film. I think Zootopia is a good animated film, and I think Kubo and Two Strings is a great uh, film. Moana is actually stuff. only my third favorite animated movie of the year. My second favorite is one that Red wasn't Turtle. even nominated, The Red Turtle, which is really good. Um, well, Lobes could pull but, for The Red Turtle. We'll have to see. Uh, the Oscar, yeah, yeah, the Oscars might put it in, uh, but I think My Life as a Zucchini will take the annual foreign movie slot. <laughs> uh, there was two but, last year, I think. Uh, yeah, I think there was. Uh, it was a Song of the Sea or something, and another yeah, one I can't remember. Song of the Sea but, uh, and Princess something, I don't know. Kaguya? That might have yeah, been two yeah, years ago. Yeah, yeah. But uh, anyway, yeah, oh, no, nice. very angered that Zootopia won. Does not deserve it. It's it's good. It's not great. It's just because it has a message. Everyone's like, ooh, relevant. And what annoyed me about the ceremony is there were so many Trump jokes. We get it. Trump sucks. He had four he's, within the first five minutes. Four. He's, he's a horrible person and he will make a bad president, but, you know, let's make the show about something else. Every other fucking presenter came up and was whinging about Trump. Like, we get it. Okay. It's bad. It's not the end the of the thing world. Is, Can we talk about, about Trump isn't going to make him not president. Oh my god! Like I was actually looking forward to Meryl, Meryl Streep winning the Cecil B. DeMille Award, and then she just came out and did a whole speech about Trump. It's like, fuck's sake! Talk about your <laughs> movies or something. I don't know, but no. I mean, I understand that people are upset and worried, and I get it. But at the same time, it's just you know, th there's nothing we can do about it. Let's not stress so much. Uh, and let's just, you know, ride the waves as they come. But uh, how do you think of Jimmy team. Fallon as a host? I thought he was pretty bad. <laughs> I thought he didn't make me laugh very much at all. Uh, I feel sorry for the guy because his opening monologue probably would have been really funny, but they mixed it up and he had to he had to do it on the spot. Uh, which actually did he actually doing... do it on the spot? Or was that yeah? Just no, a bit? no, he did. That was it. Was not a bit. He actually had to do it on the spot because they mixed up his monologue, which sucks. But um, him doing on the spot gave me one of my favorite jokes from the night. 
maybe they got it up <laughs> in time and that was already there and that would have been his whole thing. But um, no, uh, you know the uh, Matt Damon's best. Uh, I saw Matt da- one of Matt Damon's best uh, <laughs> pieces of uh, performances of all time this year when he told Ben Affleck he liked Batman vs Superman. Um, I'm an avid hater of that movie. I think it's very bad. I'm very sorry <laughs> if you like it. Uh, people can have opinions. That's fine. I don't think it's good, and it was funny. But I thought for most, yeah, I thought most of the show he was really tame. He didn't really try very hard no. with the jokes. And yeah, um, I mean, I, I the, guess, the type of comedy I like yeah. is like dark comedy, like Ricky Gervais comedy. Dude, like stuff I like love, that. Like, I like, I know everyone, really tame. Ha- like, I loved Seth MacFarlane as an Oscar host. Oh, so, he was you know, my favorite. Do with that probably. information. With as you will, He's but probably I my like favorite Oscar host. Obviously. I like the ones that aren't afraid to offend people. I don't know. It just I just enjoy that. And it makes boobs, the bump, bump. it it makes the show a bit more lively. Um, it, it, yeah, but uh, uh, this is a show. It was Ruffles all right. It was kind of it was kind of boring, but I find I thought the best presenters were uh, Steve Carell and Kristen Wiig. They were one oh, of the only easily. funny ones when they presented best animated feature and told some sad stories from their childhood associated with the first <laughs> animated film they watched. Carell was oh, absolutely so hilarious. Yeah, Carell no, was a riot. that. that no, I love how uh, they both tell their sad stories and then they just go silent and then on the screen flashes the text "best animated feature" yeah, and they're yeah. both just silent. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that yeah, that was really funny. Uh, best speech, I can't really remember too many of them being all that memorable. Uh, I Ryan loved Gosling Emma Stone's speech. I loved yeah, Emma Stone was... and Ryan Gosling's speeches. Yeah. Gosling talked about um, you know, all the how his wife he basically made it possible for him to do La La Land by, you know, helping raise their kids and stuff and Emma Stone talking about all the and dreamers her, out her there brother. and everything. I loved how excited the La La Land lyricists were with for winning best original song. They were like, yeah. This is for theatre geeks everywhere. Uh Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, but uh, um, you, you didn't. Uh, I I like Casey Affleck's speech very much. Actually, I think Casey Affleck had a fantastic speech. His was really nice. God is love. No, I know. Yeah, I mean, I don't love God, but I still think it's a great <laughs> speech. And I like how Denzel just gave him a thumbs up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he wasn't. It? Denzel looked like he wanted to sleep half the time. So. Yeah, what I just want to mention two more things. I know, funny things I noticed about audience members. One, Kenneth Lonergan looked so fucking mad that Manchester by the Sea didn't win much. Like when yeah. it lost screenplay and director, he, he looked really fucking mad. And another thing, uh, we can't the leave only it out. One actor, uh, that's it. Ryan Reynolds and Andrew Garfield kissing. Oh, making out. They were just kissing. <laughs> that was crazy. that was so. If you haven't seen it, just Google. Ryan Reynolds and Andrew Garfield in the background when the Goz wins his award, you can see the two making out in the background. Yeah. I don't know why, to lost. be frank. Oh, I, to don't, be I frank, don't really care. I don't really want to know why. It's funnier that way. Dude, it's uh, Spider-Man and Deadpool <laughs> making out. Nerds around the world would be geeking out over that. That's yeah, no, nah, that's great. Uh, so I think that's it for the Globes. That's that's one one the second one more, biggest one award show done and dusted. Nah, big, then we've. Big, Big Scott oh. Mance had Aaron Taylor Johnson fifth most likely to win supporting actor <laughs> underneath Simon Helberg. So, do with yeah. that information as you will. Yeah. What a shock! On well, I probably would have had him fifth or fourth as well. But uh, I had him fourth. Yeah. <laughs> on 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 the road on the road we've still got stuff like the SAGs. But I've lost all respect for the SAGs since they nominated Emily Blunt for Girl on the oh, Train. Get but, over uh, it. No, I will not get over she it. She was it good. Was not good. She was good. You're gonna have to face uh, it. The movie is bad, but she was good. You're gonna have to face she it. She was okay. Don't let the Not, love of don't let the hate of your film blindside her good performance, Jacob. You're dragging her down with the film. She wasn't that good though. She was great. She was alright. She was trying she was too great. hard. She um was great. just the fact she was that that film got enough. But like I can name so many people that were better than her that should have been so nominated. Can I, but she was great. None come to mind right now, but there were a lot. Oh, yeah. uh, <laughs> anyway, let's, let's go. move on. To our weekly film swap. This is basically the segment it's we do every week, like I said. Uh, basically, it's just a chance for us to give each other a movie that we've been begging them watch for so long. Like, uh, yeah, just just a movie that we've I've like. So if I've got a movie yeah. I wanted Jacob to watch for like a year, um, this time I can actually make him watch it, and they have to watch it. So next week we can v- review it. Last week, Jacob. Uh, after the podcast, we decided what we were going to give each other, and what did I give you? You can take it away. Oh, Jaron, you don't want to set the stage for this one? I can set the stage if you want, Jacob. Anyway, I gave you... Tell me why Frost you gave it to me. Nixon. 
by Ron Howard, which actually made for a great feature with, uh, 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 sorry, uh, what is it? Uh, Elvis, Elvis Nixon. Nixon. Yeah, um, but uh, no, Frost Nixon. It's one of, I love Ron Howard. This is one of my favourite films by him. Maybe even my second or third. Depends where Apollo 13 lands. Uh, Rush is easily number one. Uh, and I just think it's such a great movie. I got him to watch it once a few years ago. Um, he fell asleep about 15 minutes into it. Never went back to it. I've been bugging him ever since. It's a great movie. It's a great movie. It was boring. It's boring. I fell asleep. This week, you know what, Jacob? You're going to have to watch it because it's my film swap for you this week. What did you think about it? Yeah, it wasn't really boring. It I, th- I, th- I think I probably just fell asleep because I would have been tired that day because I watched the movie Never and it's anything it. but boring. Uh, it's the story of bloody David Frost, the uh, journalist. He was mostly known for doing fluff pieces and celebrity interviews and all that jazz. But, uh, you know, we had all the stuff with Nixon leaving the White House after the old uh, Watergate business that uh, he, he, did, he did some wrongdoing there. And uh, the, public wanted an, the public wanted an apology from Richard Nixon. And, you know, who was going to get that apology? David Frost. He spent so much of his own money to get that interview with the man himself. And, true story. Uh, yeah, yeah, true story. I, I, I've been meaning to actually go back and watch some of the actual interviews. Really, I just want to watch the look on Nixon's face at the end. But, uh, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, so they do have the series of interviews, and it's basically a battle of wits. The two characters often refer to it as them competing in a boxing match against each other, and it's this battle of wits, uh, you know, to control the interview and to try and get Nixon to give America that apology. And uh, Frost, uh, eventually, he he figs it out, and uh, he transcends what he's known for. And uh, this thing, this ended up probably being the most lasting legacy on his career, these interviews. And uh, the performances are great. Uh, M- Michael Sheen is, has never been better as Frost. He's so charming. And Frank Langella, despite not looking that much like Richard Nixon, by the end of the movie, you think you're watching the real Nick- Richard Nixon. He channeled the, he is the guy amazing. perfectly. Uh, he, was, he was fantastic. Ron Howard's The Man. This is among the best work he's ever done. My favorite film of his would be Rush. But uh, this, this is like- right up there. Uh, yeah, it's really, really riveting. It's a boxing match. Uh, they're trading blows w- with dialogue. Everyone's great. The supporting cast are great. Sam Rockwell, Oliver Platt, uh, Kevin Bacon shows up there. You've got Rebecca Hall. Uh, it's a really, really great movie and uh, probably the best film swap you've given me so far. I'd give Frost Nixon a 4.5 out of 5 stars. Out of it's uh, it's at What? Out of 6? Yeah, we've done 6 episodes. Oh, out That'll of 6, six films. Film well, this is our 6, yeah. Um... No, nah, it's uh, it's pre- pretty damn good. That's pretty much well, all I've got to say. Jacob, now it is a pod for first. You go. I'll tell you why. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> yeah, I gave Jaron a movie, one of my favorite movies of 2015. I think it was 2015. Yes. Yeah. Um, a That's German the movie, That's the uh, Brooklyn a German shit. movie called Victoria, shot in a single take. Now, Jaron, Victoria. I'll take it away. This is a pod for first, Jacob, because this is also the best film swap you've given me thus far. Uh, Victoria is about... It's not actually about uh, a bitch named Victoria. Actually, yes, it is. Her name's Victoria. She's a young Spanish woman who has newly moved... Yeah, I forgot. She's uh, she's newly moved to Berlin. She works at a cafe. She's gone to go open it one morning when she finds her flirtation with a local guy leaving a club, and that throughout the night turns potentially deadly as their night out with the mate she's um, flirting with and all his friends. Uh, they reveal a dangerous secret, and things arise. Uh, as you said, this is filmed in one take. It's two and a half hour movie. It's not like a 70 minute fluff take where they go to three places. It is absolutely incredible that they did this. This is a feat among feats. It is amazing. Uh, Technically, it is incredible and it's not just a technically great film. These characters are really, really good. Victoria was a great character. Uh, Laia Costa, I think her name is. She is fantastic in this movie. Everyone is so good. The characters have depth. They have motivation. You see why they're doing this. There's there's transformations. You know, there is... uh, uh, there's arcs. Uh, all these characters have... All, pretty much all of these characters have an arc. It's incredible. You distinguish all his friends. They're not just background noise. Uh, and, again, um, they basically just... They're, they're, no one is even credited for screenplay in this movie. At the end, they're just credited for story. It's mostly improv. 
because they said about 80% of it is improv. So they're, they're literally credited for story uh, from going place to place uh, and, you know, the major plot points towards the end, which really take charge in this last act. But uh, no, um, pretty much they improv the whole thing. Uh, they did it three times, and the third time they got it right. Uh, there's even one take, I won't spoil it, but they're driving in a car towards the last with, like, 40 minutes left, and um, uh, Laia Costa makes, like, a wrong move, and everyone's yelling at her, and she's like, oh, and, like, the camera tips down so you can't see film crew and she reverses and goes back and it makes for a really tense moment that was actually improv by everyone in the crew and it just tells you how much they well obviously just didn't want to fuck up and start all over again two hours yeah. ago but um, and there no, are these little just, dialogue mistakes in the movie that feel like mistakes people would make yeah, in real life they, like when they, they go to the like, cafe and the guy accidentally calls it a hotel you feel like yeah. that might be something that would happen in real life because they were drunk too like it just yeah, yeah it, it literally it felt really grounded in realism even though the, towards the end it turns into madness it still feels grounded oh, yeah. in realism and um, it's it was incredible I really really enjoyed this um, it maybe got a little boring uh, there was some stretches well it kind of happens when you've got a movie in one take but there were some Can't scenes edit. that were stretched out and they should have um, you know yeah, edited a little tighter or moved on a little faster is what they could have done. Um, but no, this is a great movie. I give it a four and a half out of five too. The best one you give me. I really thoroughly enjoyed watching Victoria. All right, that's film swap. That's our most successful one yet. Uh, yeah, that's another great. good one. But uh, all right, Let's we've got our last segment of the night. Uh, pretty good one. Uh, in honor of Assassin's Creed being released in Australia this last Nothing couple weeks, Jaron hasn't. Movie, Jaron hasn't seen it yet. Jaren I have. Doesn't intend it, to. And we're doing our top five favorite Michael Fassbender movies. Now, I just spoilers, uh, I Assassin's Creed won't be fucking on there. It won't even be fucking close. So yeah, just, joke yep. Star Trek. Right. yeah, I don't care. I'm remaking it because it's a good <laughs> true, joke. True, because Assassin's bad. Creed good one. was, was good so one. bad. It, it was, was a good awful. one. Maybe it give me a the little worst, at the end. It is the worst fan, Fassbender movie I've ever seen. So if we ever right. do top five worst Fassbender movies, that'll show up. There's not a lot on there to go from, but um, yeah. It no, he, he's literally only got... That's his only movie that I've ever disliked. That's actually so, bad, yeah. Yeah. Um, all right, so we're going to get started. Uh, Jaron, you can go first this time, since it's usually right. me. So uh, you, do you have some honourable mentions? My honourable mentions, then I'll go my number five, then he'll go five. Then also, he'll go this is going five. by... I'll go four, you'll go uh, four. Yep. Our rankings mostly go by our favourite films of his, but his performance in them does factor in, but uh, we're yeah. not just basing it on his performance, basing on the no, film we as well. Not. Alright, so, uh, first of all, I just want to say to everyone that 12 Years a Slave will not be appearing on my list. I find it incredibly overrated. I think the performances are great, everything's great in it, but I don't know, it's just something about it. I think it's melodramatic, I think... I'm not going to go into 12 Years a Slave, it's not going to be on my list, sorry. I still like it, 3 out of 5 movie. Anyway, a couple of honorable mentions, I got 300, he's really great in it, but he's not really in it much, and you know, it's a fine movie. One of, uh, Zack Snyder's best, though. The Light Between Oceans, the first act is, um, is, is borderline sleep material but the last two acts are fantastic I wish the first one's good as them Slow West uh, I really enjoyed that Shame is a surprising one that's not on my list but it's on here and uh, X-Men First Class one of my favourite X-Men movies it's fantastic he's great in it alright yeah number five my number five is a very indie movie that not people, not many people saw at all and it's a bit of a spoiler so if you haven't seen 2014's Frank Unlucky, it's oh, by Lenny Abrahamson, it. who did Room. Yeah, I know you have. No, I'm talking to the audience. Uh, if you, It's by Lenny Abrahamson, who, who went on to do Room, and it is Frank. Frank is, uh, it's got Michael Fassbender, it's got Maggie Gyllenhaal, Donald Gleeson, Scoot McNary, lots of good people. It is such a great movie. It's about a, a wannabe musician played by Donald Gleeson, Donald, uh, who discovers he's like bitten off a bit more than he can chew when he joins an eccentric pop band led by the mysterious Frank in the very last act, or in the last 15 minutes, found out to be played by Michael Fassbender the whole time. How Michael Fassbender can give off, like, amazing vibes and, like, charisma under a mask where you can't even see his face, it's incredible. And it's like a ridiculous mask. It's humongous, and it's just a cartoon face, and... I don't know how he did it. It's such an intriguing movie. Uh, there's really lots of layers to it. There's some great songs in it, and uh, it's really short. If you haven't seen it, I recommend you watch it. I love Frank. It's great. Michael Fassbender is amazing. Jacob? Yeah, and I love how th there's such a weird band, and the band's name is like Sauron Prefabris or something, just a bunch of consonants at the end. It's incredible. But, um, yeah, no, I've got a, some honorable mentions. Again, I mentioned 12 Years a Slave, not on my list, but I do really like it, but it's not a film I could see myself ever, ever watching again. Uh, 
Two of his X-Men movies, First Class and Days of Future Past, not on my list, but I really, really love them, and he is great as Magneto. And I thought he was fantastic in X-Men Apocalypse, just the movie the isn't as great. The movie's not that good, though. Um, yeah. And my last honorable mention is Shame, a movie I really, really loved, and he's great in it, and he's got a decent cock, so we'll, we'll, gi- we'll give him that. It's not, uh, it's not bad. <laughs> my number five, Jaron, is also that. Frank. Uh, oh, I, boy. Yeah. MJ. I love Frank. I've seen it a couple couple times now. He's so great given this whole performance behind a paper mache head, Donald Gleese. And it's based off a true story. Frank Sidebottom was this real singer. I mean, the movie takes a lot of artistic license, but it's basically made to be in the spirit of what Frank Sidebottom was like. He was just this, you know, whimsical, crazy guy that was living with a lot of darkness. And it's actually a really interesting look at, like, depression and how... um, he uses the mask to me hide his true self. And I love how their music, you watch their music and you don't really know if it's good or bad or not. You're just like, uh, I, and I went yep, into it not knowing who Frank was and it blew my fucking mind when yeah. I found out. <laughs> oh, I knew it was him. So, but I can imagine watching it without knowing it would be amazing. It's like, holy shit, it's Michael Fassbender. But no, yeah. he was so, so What's good. He doing in this? The, the mask comes off it a little bit, which is, uh, and he, yeah, he, no, he's really great. Um, uh, he's just a guy that brings everyone together around him, but he's living with a lot of darkness. And I think a lot of entertainers can relate to that. Uh, yeah, Frank, it's, it's a weird movie. Just be warned for that. But no, I love Frank. So, uh, Jaron? Jaron is going to go on to his number four. And this is a movie I think is severely underrated. You won't find this on anyone else's Michael Fassbender's list, I don't think. But I'm a fan of this franchise, and I'm Could a damn fan of this movie, and I am proud of it. It stars Logan Marshall Green, or as you know him as... Okay, it's not Tom a is it Tom Hardy? I don't know. Is it Tom Hardy? Is it Logan Marshall Green? Who knows? That guy. Guy Pierce, Idris Elba, Charlize Theron, Michael Fassbender, Numero Pace. What a cast, I know. And it is Prometheus. 2012, Ridley Scott, a team of explorers discover a clue to the origins of mankind on Earth. And it leads them to a journey to the darkest corners of the universe where they go onto this planet. And they basically they fight a terrifying battle to save the future of the human race. This movie has a lot on its mind. It has a lot of questions, a lot of ambiguity. It asks the big questions. It gives, and it gives big, big, like, it, 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 you have to, you really have to bite off a big a lot of this. And if you can't swallow it, you're not going to like the movie. Because they, they show, like, they, they tell you how they think, man, well, how mankind is made, why mankind is to be destroyed by these creators who made them. It gives, it, it really puts the human, uh, it's, it sounds like a cliche to say, but it really puts the human race under a microscope, and it's like, do we deserve to be killed? Because, you know, they're given a lot of logic to why they should. And uh, the creators in this, I think they're called the creators, they're absolutely scary. Um, they're so cool. The last half an hour of this movie Aren't they is called like the borderline. engineers? The engineers, that's it. Thank you. They're borderline terrifying in this last act. And then the last five minutes is the fuck yes moment that you wait for the whole film, which is why we're getting... Uh, spoiler Alien Covenant to the end uh, I absolutely loved it Michael Fassbender is going to be showing up in the next Alien movie too because this is part of the Alien franchise uh, I think this is just so good Benedict Wong is in this too which <laughs> surprised the hell out of me uh, you know him from Doctor Strange and he's really skinny in this so skinny oh yeah <laughs> I, saw I was like is that Benedict Wong what that, no no but like it is and uh no I I really really lo- love Prometheus sorry I swallowed my own words there i love right. prometheus four and a half out of five for me jacob you go my number four is sure to piss a lot of people off and it's widely regarded as his best performance and i upon thinking it's actually my second favorite performance of his but it's steve jobs uh yeah uh i really really like steve jobs last year dude fassbender had a killer year in 2015 uh and he was he was Oscar nominated for it, probably nearly won. If Leo DiCaprio hadn't have been up for The Revenant, I think Steve, um, Fassbender would have won for Steve Jobs. And uh, I really can't wait to see him win an Oscar. But um, it's set at three different Apple product reviews. It's a really interesting way of telling a story, and I think it worked. Aaron Sorkin's dialogue, sizzling man, sizzling. One of the best screenplays Chills. of Chills. last year. Uh, 2015 now, I keep calling it last year. But um. Yeah. <laughs> No, Fassbender was absolutely perfect. Again, he doesn't really look much like the character, but that doesn't matter because he embodied the spirit of it. Uh, It made Seth Rogen great. Catherine Waterston was really good in it. Kate Winslet. Oh, yeah, he's a great comedian, but it showed that he could actually do some drama as well, which was really cool to see. Um, No, I love Steve Jobs. I don't have a whole lot to add on. I really need to watch it again. I haven't seen it since it 
first came out. Uh, but I loved his performance in it. It was my favorite thing about the movie, and uh, the dialogue was incredible. But yeah, Steve Jobs only fourth. I know. I, I apologize. My number three. I am going to go. This may piss a lot of people off, may not. It depends on your taste. My favourite X-Men movie, it is Days of Future Past. That's right, I love First Class. I don't like Apocalypse. Days of... Even though he's fantastic in it. Days of Future Past. I love the movie. He is absolutely exhilarating as Magneto when he goes off and he, he is just pissed off at everybody. He lifts up that stadium. It's just such a good movie. It... It seamlessly blends the new cast and the old cast with uh, Wolverine walking that fine line. Um, excellent performances by everyone. It was Jennifer Lawrence's last I don't I, I give a shit about this character movie playing Mystique, even though, because I don't know why she's the crux of this trilogy, whatever. To piss me off. I, I'm not going to piss myself off. Uh, it's just such a great movie. Um, and I can rewatch it a lot. Uh, I love everyone in it, especially Fassbender. He's always great as Magneto. His character shines in this one more than he ever did, even in Apocalypse. Uh, his arc is a lot larger. He has a lot more to do. Um, and that scene where he gets broken out of uh, the the plastic prison is fantastic. The end scene with him, he's just amazing in this movie. Full stop. Jacob, what's your three? My number three is one I actually don't think you've seen, and against popular opinion, yeah, it's third, but this is actually my favourite performance Fassbender has ever given. It's another 2015 movie, and it's Macbeth. Uh, I Macbeth is by Justin Kurtzel, who had so much potential, and then he just recently went and fucked up Assassin's Creed, but Macbeth shows us what Justin Kurtzel can do, because it is a fantastic movie. Uh, I really... I do love the story of Macbeth. I've done it a few times in school, and I always really, really enjoyed reading it. I, I, I like the story. I think nah. it's a great story. And yeah, I've but seen anyone a couple... who reads is a nerd. That's yeah, just... true, I guess. <laughs> but um, <laughs> I mean, I read, but anyone who reads is a nerd. I, I remember we had to read out the play in school, and I, I played oh, I Macbeth and did the whole thing Scottish with a Scottish accent. accent. It was beautiful. I laid um, on my accent was thick mustard my, on a sandwich. My accent was terrible, but um, you know, oh, mine was, was fantastic a experience. Ah, how you doing there, Sonny? My name's Macbeth. <laughs> How's Is that, that a dagger I see before me? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we are fantastic. I could yeah, basically yeah. be an actor. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. I, I'm, I could be Michael Fassbender, but no. Uh, oh, yeah. anyway. It's the dark and gritty Macbeth movie we were looking for. I've seen a co- I've seen the old one. I think it was by was it by Roman Polanski? Maybe. Yeah, I don't I've know. But it. this is my this is my favorite one. Uh, it, the camera work is incredible. Cinematographer Adam Arkapor is almost the star of the movie. It had some of the best cinematography of 2015. It's absolutely gorgeous. The way they use the red lighting from the fire in the forest at the end. Uh, it's beautifully, beautifully shot. The way they use oh, shadows and silhouettes. Uh, Michael Fassbender is incredible. It's all done in the old Shakespearean tongue, which is awesome. Uh, Marion Cotillard is great in it. And, uh, you know, what a disappointing follow-up was Assassin's Creed. But seriously, Macbeth is actually my favorite performance he's ever done. And I, yeah, uh, it wasn't, didn't get a whole lot of recognition, but I What is it with indie directors and then going on to do video game movies and just poop the bed? Like Doug Jones, Wait, Come on, man. What'd you say? Not Doug Jones. What is it with indie directors making a great indie film and then going on to do a video game movie? Like Moon going on to Warcraft? Come on, bro. Well, they both did like a really small film and then a slightly bigger film and then a shitty video game movie. Like Jones started with Moon, then did Source Code and then Warcraft. And then Kurtzel did the Snowtown Murders, which I haven't seen yet, but I've heard good things. And he did Macbeth. And, which was a bit bigger budget, and then he in did Australia. fucking Assassin's Creed, which was even worse on, than bro. Warcraft. It was so like, was there a contract? Was there like a contract clause for the this team yeah. that well, like, Jacob, oh, all right, you you can do Macbeth, yeah, but probably. then you have to do Assassin's Creed. And Jacob, their second film is both their best. So, oh, <laughs> yeah. Oh no, 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 yeah, no, yeah, no, yeah. Moon, no, no, it's Moon. Code, man. All right, we're getting way off topic here. <laughs> Top five Sam Rockwell we'll movies. That's another list for another day. But I absolutely <laughs> implore that you check out Macbeth if you have not already. In fact, that may be a film swap coming up. Uh, yeah, it's great. You're number oh, two. Yeah. I went on way too long on Macbeth. 
All right, my number two. Yes, you did. Uh, I'm not even going to go long on this one because you've already talked about it. My favourite Fassbender performance, and I haven't seen Macbeth, Steve Jobs. This came out two years ago now. It's by Danny Boyle. As you said, my favourite modern screenwriter working today, Aaron Sorkin, A Few Good Men, The Social Network. Uh, he, he's done a lot of good things. That Tom Hanks one that I can't remember the name for. And now Steve Jobs. This is absolutely fantastic. He is mesmerising this. Everyone is great in this. Steve, Seth Rogen, fantastic in this. Really Really, like, even bo- almost brought a tear to my eye in that last scene when he's standing there. And that, that monologue, what do you do, man? I do this, they do this, blah, blah, blah. You do nothing. And he's like, and he's like, I am the conductor. You are all my orchestra. Fantastic I, writing. I play Fantastic the acting. Yeah, exactly. And Michael Fassbender, he's absolutely 100% believable. It looks like you're watching a documentary of the real guy. That's how believable he is as the CEO of Apple Computers who wears New Balance. Anyway, Jacob, what's your number two? My numero two is, uh, now we're getting to just the movies that he's in that I love the most, but uh, he's great in this, and my number two is a movie that didn't make your list, it's Slow West. Uh, Another, three out of my top five, three out of my top five have been from 2015, yeah, that was a killer year for him in my opinion. Uh, It's an an old western, and it's about a, a young Scottish kid, well, teenager, uh, played by Cody Smith McPhee, named Jay Cavendish, and uh, he he heads to the U.S. to track down uh, the woman he loves, who is on the run from the law. And uh, Michael Fassbender plays Silas. This uh, he's like a drifter, you know, just sort of trying to survive out in the West. And he saves the kid from some bandits, and then the two end up teaming up. Uh, you know, the kid pays Fassbender to help him. Uh, make his way through the West, but little do we know, Fassbender's character is actually looking for the bounty on uh, his girlfriend's head. So, you know, there's that interesting dynamic, but the two grow to bond over the film, and much to its name, it's a slow-paced Western. It's darkly comedic. I mean, the the oh, ending, yeah. I think, is like Shit. bitter, dark, black irony, and uh, I really, really love that about it's it. It's hilarious and, uh, when you think about it, and it's so dark. <laughs> yeah. Um, but no, the two have great chemistry. Michael Fassman is really good. He doesn't say much. He's pretty quiet. He's very gruff and, you know, scowls a lot, but uh, he was really, really good, and uh, I, I just love this movie. I think it has gorgeous cinematography. Uh, this this, the score for this was composed by the same guy. The score for this was composed by the same guy who did the music for Mac- Mac- Macbeth. Uh, Jed Kurtzel, the brother of the director of Macbeth. Uh, I think he's a great, great composer. And the music in this, I think, is really, really great. Uh, the, you know, deep violins and cellos. And uh, no, I really, really recommend Slow West, another movie that was tragically underseen. In 2015. All right. Uh, what is your number one? I think I know All what right, it Jacob. is. My number one is X-Men. Apo- no, Jacob, feel free to discuss because Jacob and I's combined number one without even knowing his yeah, we, list. We haven't discussed this beforehand, but we just know. Quentin Tarantino's Inglorious Bastards. That's your number yeah. one, isn't it's it? Not, 100%. It's, it's, yeah, it's not Fassbender's movie, but it's a Fassbender movie. Oh, in so fact, he's only in it by about 25 minutes. It may be yeah. less. But, but, you know, it qualifies. Oh, it's, oh yeah. And if we were going performances, this would not be my number one, but it's Inglorious Bastards, man. This movie is amazing. It's in my top five favorite movies ever. I can't not put it number one. Yeah, it's, it's my favorite even Tarantino Even when Fassbender's movie. in it, he is incredible. He he's almost he's almost sinks into this role so much you don't even realize it's Fassbender and when he comes on. Sadly, and he's actually in my favorite scene of the movie. Oh, yeah, the bar scene. And sadly, yep. he was shot in the balls because he didn't know the German sign for number three. To be fair, though, he also shot the other lad in the balls, too, so... Yeah, you know, he got some retribution. After he was shot in the balls. People getting shot in the balls, what more could you want from a Michael Fassbender movie? We saw that we we saw that great penis in shame and then we saw it shot off and get destruction. We saw it get absolutely destroyed. (laughs) Unlucky M. Fassbender, his penis has been through a lot of things. I think it's Tarantino's masterpiece. The 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 story's great. I think the opening scene is so incredible and underrated with uh uh, Christoph Waltz oh, coming to that's, Mr. That, Mr. Lapidus' house. That may even house. be my favorite scene. It's between those two because I love it's that so scene. It's so suspenseful. And uh, you know what I know? I think the guy who plays Mr. Lapidus was in Assassin's Creed. I haven't looked it up, yeah. but I just, I, I'm pretty sure it was him. I'm going to have to look that up. But um, oh, that was probably the best thing about Assassin's Creed. Hey, a guy from that good movie is in it. Nah, uh, yeah. But Fuck, seriously, Assassin's like, Creed was so Inglourious bad. Inglorious Bastards. Let's let's talk about the good thing, man. Inglorious Bastards. <laughs> it's my second favorite Tarantino movie. I've seen all his movies except Death Proof. I need to see that. It's on my watch list. Uh, 
and this is my second favorite one. I absolutely adore this movie. It's so fun. There is not one moment of dullness. It's so always so fun. Even when it gets into dramatic, it goes into dramatic territory. It's always so fun. Let's talk about how good Brad Pitt is. Bonjourno. I speak the most Italian. He speaks the second most Italian. He speaks the third most. Actually, I don't speak Italian. Yeah, that's why I said third most. He is so... He is, a, he is an absolute riot in this. I want my scalps. Sorry about that accent. You I just have to do it. get me my scalps. Everyone is amazing in this. Oh, a big Fenway pack. Smashing... Fenway a, pack. Donnie, the Donnie. Bear Jew, the Bear Jew. The Bear Jew smashes a Nazi's head in with a baseball bat. C- do you want... What else do you, what want? you want? If that doesn't sound awesome, stop listening to this podcast. Please don't. We love you. Yeah. I mean, it, it's fun, but at the same time, you know, it is like... It's the tr- story of Shoshana is a tragic story, and uh, you know you really do feel emotion for that character. Daniel but Brolin then the ul- the ultimate revenge, oh, yeah. uh, destroying the movie theater, and just the fact that how we get to see Hitler's down, corpse sh- riddled with bullets, just <laughs> this is how getting it, shot. It, it goes to death. up there with. It's it's up there with most iconic, uh, most <laughs> iconic world world leaders being destroyed with Kim Jong Un in the interview. Yeah, <laughs> they're both way up there. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, but, um, a face, a face slowly being dissolved by a by a by a bomb going into a helicopter. It's tough to beat, but they just about did it. Yeah, Fast Vendor was great. I think his character's name was uh, Archie Hickox, and just the way he's like he had that scene with Mike Myers, like, "Oh yes, old sport, uh, we're yeah. going going into the the yeah, war or whatever." I he's can't just remember the in that bar scene, but watch it for that bar scene. But nah, it's he about was fifteen really minutes, and the last five minutes is just pure tension and then ball shooting. You're just mm-hmm. gonna want to watch yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, even the scene after that when everyone's been shut up and there's the one guy left down there and Brad Pitt's trying oh, to come yeah. in and it's like, you know, uh, can we, we trust you, man? I don't or know if I can trust no. you. You don't put that gun down. <laughs> yeah, it's like, okay, I'll do I'm going to trust you. And then she just Thumbs fucking down. gets up and shoots him. Yeah, rip. Although Brad Pitt probably would have shot him anyway. But, um... Yeah, yeah, obviously. Seriously. <laughs> Such a great movie. That ends it for our top five Michael Fassbender movies. The guy's got a bright future. He's still so young. He's going to make hundreds, yeah. uh, not hundreds, but he's going to make many, that, many films. Got a bit carried that away That kid's there. got a future in the film business. Oh, yeah. That, he'll, he'll grow up strong. He's going to be an Oscar winner someday. Mark these words. Uh, literally, I'm probably, definitely the first one to say that, so mark this podcast. <laughs> Uh, anyway, <laughs> we're the first people to make that observation. Yeah, very literally, very. Fit. You know what? I think he's a good actor, and I think I may be the first person to say that. So, everyone, yeah. it's been a short podcast. It's actually how long it should go for, but it's <laughs> run its time, and uh, it's the first time we're actually finishing almost on time. On time, Jacob. Thank you so much for being the co-host to myself. It would be boring if I was just talking by myself. We have a great show here, and uh, I really enjoyed today. Yeah, uh, I had a good one. I'm very tired. I'm going to go watch a movie now. And uh, thanks for watching, of course. Check out all of our other videos. We've got a lot of good stuff. Uh, check out my main channel, Inside Jacob's Mind. You have confined my top 10 worst movies list of the year. No, I di- hadn't seen Assassin's Creed when I made it, but rest assured Assassin's Creed would be high on that fucking list because Assassin's Creed was so bad. Please don't ever watch it. It was so bad. Uh, it's my PSA. To. Don't. It's not worth if it. If you fairly enjoyed it, like I it. enjoyed Passengers, I would have seen it. But I'm not going to. Oh. I'll just wait uh, for. I'm just going to go see La La Land again for the third time. Oh, yeah, that's a good choice. This weekend, yeah. I'm going up to the city. I'm going to see Patterson, a United Kingdom. I'm going to see Jackie. I'm going to see La La Land again, oh, and Kingdom. who knows what else. Well, Sorry? I am yeah. there. They both. They all look good. Uh, yeah. I, so, uh, yeah. Look forward to next week's podcast. We'll have some new film swaps. We'll have some new diary entries. We'll have. We might. We're gonna have some reviews this week because I'm sure Jacob will want to. I know what Madison our top five will be United next Kingdom. week. You know what? Oh yeah. What's it gonna be? Top five actually, films about a bus driving poet. Oh fuck, dude! You shouldn't have given that away. We should have saved it for the next podcast. Leaving Sorry. suspense. Uh, fuck. We'll do it all in a right. few weeks then. That sucks. Yeah. Actually, let's go. Top five movies where Natalie Portman wears a red dress the whole time. Ooh, so all of her films. Yeah, every single one. Literally, so there's top five Natalie one Portman film. films. Yeah, actually, that that's that's actually in contention. Uh, you heard top nothing. five original musicals written and directed by Damien Chazelle. Oh fuck, that's hard, man. I wouldn't be able. To, there's like at least a good twenty or something. Yep. Anyway, okay, let's sarcastic wait, humor. Let's if it doesn't make you laugh, the you inevitable. must hate us right now and yeah we'll 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 leave you be 
So, uh, yeah, thank you for watching. Uh, go watch our other videos. We'll have a new one up in about a week if we're on time, maybe a bit later. Uh, yeah, I'm Jaren. That's Jacob. We are Children of Film. We love film and we love children. Stop, man. You've ha you <laughs> got to stop that one. I'm calling the police. Am I wrong? Am I wrong? Well, you know, I, you, you're not wrong when you speak about yourself, but uh, I personally only love the former. But, uh, yeah, that, that, thanks for it's listening, children. guys. Cheers, lads.